How do you move a, an idea prototype to manufactured product? Well, this is the question that Jean asked me over on Instagram. And Jean, I'm so happy that you asked me this question because I've been wanting to make this video for a really long time. What I've come to learn is that this area of the process where you turn a, a final concept into a you know thoughtful, rational, beautiful, viable, uh, manufacturable product, this is the great challenge of designing a physical product. I thought that if I could buy all the books and read them, then somehow, magically, this would all make sense to me <laughs> and I would know what to do. But I can tell you now <laughs> that that is just like so wrong. Because even though I did, I, I bought books, I read some of them, the problem with thinking that this was a correct strategy is that um, what you actually need is a practical, hands-on method for figuring this out. Well, I can tell you, in order to get a manufactured product, you need to have files to give to a factory. And in order to have the right type of files to give to a factory, um, there is a process that's called design for manufacture um, and assembly. So, and that process is its own separate process, okay, where you take um, all the parts and redesign them for their manufacturing process and assembly and then some other things too. Once that process is finished, then you have the files that can be given to a factory. But in order to start that process, your design needs to be split into parts. Uh, you need to know your materials, and you also need to know the manufacturing process. I think of this, this area of the process as really figuring out the design. You know, anyone can sketch anything, anyone can model something in the computer, but that does not mean that it is a design. And so um, this kind of process is where you actually um, execute. You know, if I can use the analogy in, in business, they say that, you know, ideas are a dime a dozen and execution is everything. Well, it's the same thing with product design. In the design process, we are trying to create something like this lovely mouse from nothing, okay? This is, this is nothing. And we don't really know what the solution is going to look like when we're starting out. So we're moving in a direction that is kind of unfamiliar, unknown. We don't really know what, what it is yet. So what is necessary to, to move um, forward is to start to bring in elements of reality into our design. I don't want to oversimplify things, but you know, if you're learning to ride a bike, they say that you, know, you'll, you will go in the direction that you're looking. So if our destination is a manufacturable solution, we need to start looking at the world of manufactured products for guidance and for learning. So how can we access this guidance? Well, once you know how your design or some aspect of your design needs to function, you need to ask questions and brainstorm. What are all the products in the world that function like how I want my design to function? And in this way, what you're doing is you're seeking similarity. And once you've made a list, then you need to start looking at those things and asking more questions. It's a process of analogical thinking and and educated guesses. These are the two tools that are really gonna be your friend in this process. And the thing with analogical thinking and the reason why it's so powerful is it brings familiarity and what is known into situations that are unfamiliar, unknown. And this is what the design process is, right? Because there are many times in the design process where you don't know what the answer is and you need to find a practical, hands-on way of, of finding uh, and bringing what is known into this process that is unknown. I'll be showing you an example in a minute and uh, it should be 
more clear. The other thing is the um, educated guess and the power that the educated guess has, it's a guess that's based on some learning. So we've done some kind of learning and we can make a good enough guess that, that, that what we've learned will work in this new circumstance, which will become our design. Let's look at the OXO vegetable peeler um, as an example. So in the design process, the designers discovered that it was desirable to make this area um, between the thumb and the, uh, the index finger uh, squishy. And the story goes that the designers found a bicycle grip, put it on a peeler, and discovered that it, uh, it works. We could look at the bicycle grip, we could pick it up, put it in our hands, and ask ourselves, is this how we want our design to feel? And if it is, then we can start to go about recreating uh, the qualities and, and things about it that make it what it is. So we can start to ask questions like, what material is this bicycle grip made from? And would that material be appropriate for my design? We can also ask, you know, what manufacturing process made this bicycle grip? And would that manufacturing process be appropriate for my design? And in this way, we're making a link between our final concept and a manufactured product. And we're taking advantage of the fact that the ingredients in a product, things like form, function, material, manufacturing process, are all interrelated. And typically what happens is if you find a, a, a product that functions in a way that you want your design to function, then usually there are other ingredients that will follow suit, that will be appropriate for your design, such as material or material qualities. And it's at this point uh, in the process when you find that, a manufactured product that performs in some way that you want some aspect of your design to perform in, you can then use the power of the educated guess. With the bicycle grip, it would be to recreate the details and the material qualities that the bicycle, that specific bicycle grip had. Uh, we could measure uh, uh, the wall thickness. We could measure how far those, uh, the ribs protrude from the main body. We can measure um, the distance between each of the ribs. And we can also measure um, the durometer of the material, which for if you don't know what durometer is, it's just like, um, like the squishiness or hardness of a material. And that's just like a tool that you buy and you just stick it on the thing and test it and get a number out of 100 and that's the durometer. <laughs> once, we would, once we had all that information, we can then take all of that information and then start and transfer it into our design recreate it in a way that we want it to be in our design and we've just made an extremely good educated guess if we recreate all these things that we, we we've tested put it in our hands and know and put them into our design well the the guess is that they're going to feel the same way in our design now if it's not exactly how we want our our grip to feel the bicycle grip then becomes like a baseline where you can sort of jump off and say, okay, well, you know, maybe if we made um, the, uh, we made, maybe if we made it in a, a higher durometer, it would be a little bit stiffer and then that would feel better or something like that. Okay. But you can start to make, again, make educated guesses because you've taken all of this information, all of the details, and you can, you can make a very good guess about how your design will perform. If you replicate what is known <laughs> and bring in what is known and familiar into your, into your design process, which is unknown and unfamiliar, then you can, you can start to make these educated guesses where you can be confident, like, yeah, I think, I think this is going to work. It's going to translate and be like this. Hope you enjoyed the video, and uh, if you did, give it a thumbs up, leave me a comment, and we'll see you guys later.